so glad you guys are here today. Uh, Living Water, here at Living Water, I'll just, at Living Water, our vision is uh, to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So um, when people ask me, what do I do at Living Water? I'm a disciple maker. Um, I also sometimes am back at the tech booth, uh, or probably more accurately, just wandering around visiting and hugging people, but I'm a disciple maker. Um, you might ask, how could I be a disciple maker? <laughs> Liv- yeah. Living Water's invitation to you is to attend one, serve one, uh, bring one, and disciple one. So good news, you've checked box one, you have attended one. If you're a box maker, list maker like I am, yay! One is checked off your list. (laughs) Now, serving, we have a great need. I mean, I don't know if you've seen how much we have grown. I mean, it's exciting. I mean, God is doing such great things in Living Water and Yelm. Um, We've gone to two services. Our children's ministry is exploding. (laughs) Those kids, and and actually, uh, someone told me this morning, you know, we always say kids are the future. Kids are actually the present Kids are here. Kids are, you know, they are our church. So we really have a call to um, get more people to serve in children's ministry. If you think that you um, want to serve in children's ministry, please fill out a Connect card. Find um, anyone actually at our church. We can connect you with someone. Um, But like Pastor Susie's out there for both services today. Uh, So we really need people serving our children in all aspects of it. You think, oh, I don't know if I could do that. You can. There's lots of places. You don't have to be a lead teacher. You can be an assistant. You can sign people in. You can be a cheerleader. Also, we really want you to pray for our children's ministry. I mean, I was telling them on my heart all this week, praying people are powerful people. Someone told me a long time ago, praying, a praying mama was powerful. And I will tell on my mom is that, pray for your children. But also, pray for everyone. Pray for the church. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your friends. A praying person is a powerful person. And we would love prayers for our children's ministry. And we would love people to step up and volunteer. So if you are a mom, a grandma, anyone, gr- grandpa, dad, just a youth person. I saw someone last week, there was a call to volunteer, and I saw back there a a young man literally jump out of his chair and tap Riley on the counter, on the shoulder. And I was like, that is the youth that we are bringing up in this church. He jumped right up and said, I'll volunteer to her. And I was like, that's so great. So there you go. There's your call to uh, hopefully serve in children's ministry. And then don't forget the bring one Bring your friends. It's so much fun to worship with your friends. I love coming to church. This is when I get to see all my friends. So, (laughs) um, okay. The Connect card, I wrote my notes on it so I wouldn't forget to (laughs) tell you about things. Fill it out. If you don't feel like you've been connected here at Living Water, this is the way to do it. If you feel like you have prayer requests or praise reports, we, I mean, we want to hear them. So, Fill that Connect card out. Get connected. Um, If you don't know where you could serve, just put down there, this is what I think I have to offer to Living Water, and they will connect you. So fill that out. We have a few things happening this week. I'm super excited about the first one, um, an evening to remember. And I will be as bold to say this is our first annual. (laughs) Our first annual couples dinner. Um, This is going to be Friday the 16th. Uh, It's been so fun to plan, and I can't wait for, there's only four spots left. So if you haven't registered, register now. It's okay. You can pull your phone out. I won't be offended. Pull your phone out, get it, get registered for that. Um, Also, here's the bonus to that, free child care. We have partnered with um, Yelm Prairie Christian Center, and we are going to have a fun children's event at the same time. So you can drop your kids off, come over to the dinner, have just a wonderful time with us, and then go back and pick them up. You can't leave them there, but, um, but pick them up when you're done, and they'll have fun, and they'll be tired, so they'll go home and go straight to bed. Um, also, 
EHS is starting Emotional Healthy Spirituality. It starts February 26th here at church at 630. Um, I can't even speak enough about Emotional Healthy Spirituality. This is such a great opportunity for you to slow down, get connected with Jesus, and really just learn how to live every day in more in less of a stress and more more of at peace with Jesus. If you have any questions, please see the Connect Center. Um, I would love to answer questions about this. You can register online. Um, it, it's just it's an eight week course. It's so fabulous. I can't speak enough about it. Then, last but not least, is men's. There's a men's retreat coming up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm not a man, but I have a bunch of lovely men in my life. Um, it's uh, March 8th through the 10th. It's called A Man and His Calling. Um, the, and here, I, I read all about it this last night and this morning, and here's what I took away. I would encourage you, first of all, to go to that link and read about it before you make a decision. If you're like, eh, that's not really for me, go read about it. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. So this is what I wrote down. Um, it, what I got from it is it's a pause. It's a pause for men to connect. I mean, we all know life is super busy, and nobody takes time. I think right now it's really important. Like women, we're like, oh, we're going to do me time. But guys don't have that opportunity. So this is your opportunity. So this is a pause to check in with each other, with God. It is... Uh, it's a time for you to have a spiritual um, transformation in relationships with others, with God, uh, relationally, oh, sorry, spiritually with God, relationally with others, vocationally, and just recreational. What are you doing to fill your life? Those, all those questions will be answered. It'll be a great time. Registration is open now. Register online. Um, for all of these and more, go to Living Water slash Yelm Events. Good. <laughs> We're going to continue our uh, worship by giving God um, our offerings for him. I'll have them come forward. You, there's three ways you can give. Uh, you can give by texting. You can give online or when the bags are passed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I, I really just thank you again for starting my week here at Living Water. Thank you for what's about to be received. Please, I just ask that you take what we have, take what's already yours, and just multiply it. Help us really make an impact here at Living Water, in our community, and the world as a whole. Uh, please let us see what you have planned for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And would you thank Carrie for just doing an awesome job being an awesome person? Thank you, Carrie. Guys, I'm super stoked about this men's retreat. I really encourage you to, to get signed up. And, um, uh, and again, evening to remember, four spots left. 11 o'clock probably won't have them because you're all going to take them. So get signed up. Well, how are you guys doing? If I haven't met you yet, I'm Bob Horn. I'm the lead pastor here. And it's really good to see your faces today. You're going to eat a lot of food today? I know I am. Yep. So glad the fast is over because now I'm like just making up for lost opportunity, right? <laughs> oh, man. Well, this morning we're beginning a new series. And it's called How It Ends, A Hopeful Look at the Last Days. And on your seats are postcards for you to share with others about this series. Gives you some overview about where we're going when I ask, when I say last days, what are the last days? Does that, does that term mean anything to you? It has to do with a word, a bigger word, a Bible theological word called eschatology. You heard this word before, eschatology? Eschatology is the study of last things. It comes from two Greek words, eschatos, meaning last, and logos, meaning study. So this is a study of last things. We might use the term last days or end times interchangeably, but this is going to be a series that is going to address what we believe about the end, 
about the end times and the last days. And all of, our, all of the monotheistic world religions have an eschatology. They have a, a belief system about how the world will end. If, uh, if you were to talk to a Jew, Judaism, which we share this, their eschatology, but with Jews, they are anticipating the Messiah, the Messiah's first appearing because they, they don't believe that Jesus or Yeshua is the Messiah, so they're awaiting the Messiah's first coming. They are waiting uh, for God to return the Jewish people to the land of Israel, which actually we're seeing. It's been happening since 1948. We, uh, the Jews anticipate that God will re resurrect the dead. God will create a new heaven and a new earth. If you look at Islam, if you were to talk to a Muslim and ask them about their eschatology, they would say that we consider Jesus a prophet, but not the Messiah. Muslims believe in the coming of a messianic figure called the Mahdi, who will rid the world of evil and injustice. And then Christians, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have an eschatology. We believe that because of what this book, the Bible, says, is that there will be the rise of an evil world leader known as the Antichrist. It will be a time of great tribulation. We believe in Jesus' second coming. He is coming back to earth. We believe that God's judgment, God will judge the living and the dead, and that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. That's eschatology. And I have, I've had kind of a, an experience, even as a new believer, with eschatology and learning about the end times in the last days. I, I got saved in 1989, and so the, the 90s was my kind of time of spiritual formation. And during the 90s, uh, for those of you that were were around back then, you might remember some things about the 90s. There was a book series that came out called Left Behind. Yeah. It was published in 1995. There were 16 books. It was made a movie in the year 2000, several movies. But that was like one of the first things that I read as a new believer was reading about this group of people that the rapture had happened and all the Christians had been removed from the earth and there was these people left behind and how they encountered the tribulation and the rise of the Antichrist and it was this crazy novel, this narrative about, about being left behind. I also remember during that time, um, at the time, my wife and I were attending Living Water Olympia, and our pastor, Bert Smith, did a wonderful series on the book of Revelation. Like, took us through the entire book. And if you've ever read Revelation, it's a lot. And he preached it, you know, serve by, verse by verse. And uh, so that was part of my early formation. One of the things that I... Uh, and I'll add, to, I'll add to this. You might recall if there's something that happened in 1999 when we, began, when we began to anticipate the turn of the millennium, year 2000. Everybody remember? Y2K, right? <laughs> Y2K. Those of you that don't know what we're talking about, we, people that were alive in 1999, had this, this fear that all of our computers would stop working at midnight on, on the dawn of 2000. They just would stop and the entire world would be thrown back into the dark ages because our computers couldn't calculate like another zero or something. It didn't happen. I remember newscasters like watching, watching New Year's Eve become New Year's Day in Australia, and they're like, yep, everything's fine. And we're like, it was like, blip. <laughs> but this was my early Christian experience, left behind, Book of Revelation, Y2K, and what I discovered was that a lot of my formation around the end times had a lot to do with fear and not a lot about hope. So my approach this morning is, and through this series, is that this would be a hopeful look at the last days, a hopeful look, that I'm approaching this topic as a co-learner with you. I'm excited about this. I, I am going to... Uh, engage each message with the hope that we have in Jesus, and it's not my intent to instill fear. Let me tell you a little bit about why studying the end times matters, why this matters. Warren Wiersbe has a great quote, your theology will determine your philosophy, your philosophy will determine your decisions, and your decisions will determine your destiny. So from that quote, I really came up with this bottom line for our, for our more for our morning today. What we think about Jesus' return and how it ends affects how we live for Christ every day. So what you believe about Jesus' return will affect 
your philosophy, which will, affect, which will affect your decisions, which will affect your destiny. So what you believe about Jesus is going to have an impact on how you live your days. So that's why your theology about the end times matters. I want to ask a question, and we're going to do this in a novel way. I want to find out what word comes to mind when you think about the end times. So I want you to pull out your phone. We're going to put up, we're going to use this, this uh, website, slido.com. You just point your camera at the QR code. You'll see a little link up here. Click that link, and it'll take you to, to my poll, my little page here. And if you don't have a camera on your phone, um, that's probably because you're still in 1999. And, but you can go to slido.com and punch in those numbers. Okay, if you're there... I'll go ahead and let Mark advance the slide. Here's my question. What, you can, you can still, you can still get it. It's right there on that QR code. Zoom in. What word comes to mind when you think of the end times? So when you click on that link, you'll see the question will appear and you can just add in your, uh, your number. Or you can put in the numbers of, of the, um, of the, yeah. So I got salvation. What else? What other words? Wedding. I'm going to read these as they show up. Destruction. Scary. Yep. Tribulation. Peace. Tribulation. Jesus coming back. Eternity. Power. Opportunity. Rapture. Doom. Revival. Heaven. Unknown. Anxiety. Reuniting. This is great. This is working. I love it. Yeah. Victory. Freedom. Revival, I think I read that. Heaven, beauty, fire, victory, Jesus, chaos, mark of the beast. Cool. Keep on doing that. I'll leave that up for a few minutes. By the end of this series, this is what I hope will take, will take place. And this series is going to take us right up to Easter. This is my prayer. My prayer is that you will feel Hopeful, secure, calm, peaceful, curious. My prayer is that you'll be open to engaging hard questions. That you'll be reflective about your own theology, what you believe about God. And you'll follow your curiosity to study deeper. I really pray that this series will provoke some questions that, that makes you talk with one another and makes you go into deeper study. My prayer is that you'll know that Jesus really is coming back. And there are consequences to your theology or lack thereof. And there are different viewpoints and interpretations, and each has valid arguments. And here's the thing. How will, how will we know if we did that? Jeff Watchman sent me a little quote as we were anticipating this series. And he's, this is the quote he sent me. God did not give us the book of Revelation so we'd build bigger bomb shelters. He gave us this book so we'd build bigger dinner tables and invite our friends over and tell them about Jesus. Is that so good? Man, I wish I had read that back in 1999 when I was filling four 55-gallon drums with drinking water. All right, I want to give you four major views of Christian eschatology. Four views of Christian eschatology. A little bit of big teaching here for you. I'll, I'll set it up with this way. Your approach determines your destination. I was uh, on a flight to and from Los Angeles this past week, and you know, gazing into the pilot's the, the, uh, cockpit, I thought, saw all those instrument panels, and I thought, my goodness, I'm really glad that they know where they're going and how to get us back home, because if I were in there, I'd be like, I have not the slightest idea. You know, your approach determines your destination. So a cockpit and the pilot in the cockpit, they preset their coordinates. They have to stay on course the entire way. You know this, that if the flight path is off even just a degree or two at the beginning of their journey and they never course correct, they, they will miss the runway. They'll miss the airport. They might even miss the destination city. That could be landing in Billings, Montana. So your approach determines your destination. There's four approaches of how we connect and understand eschatology. I'm going to give you all four of them and briefly describe them. Here's the first one. It's called the preterist approach. The preterist believes that everything has already been fulfilled. 
that Bible prophecy has been completed, principally in the events of the first century around the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. So the preterist says, yeah, it's already happened. It's, it's done. The historist says that views Bible prophecy within the context of history, identifying figures and passages in Bible prophecy with major historical people and events. So kind of like the preterists, but they, they look at all of Bible prophecy as, as representing the history of the church. Then there's the idealist who views Bible prophecy as allegory. It symbolizes the ongoing struggle and ultimate triumph of good over evil. So they read Revelation and say, oh, it's all, it's all symbolism, it's all allegory, it's allegorical of God's triumph over evil. And then the fourth one is the futurist. The futurist is a person who understands Bible prophecy, that which is unfulfilled, will take place at some yet future point in time. By the end of this morning, you'll probably be able to figure out where I land in here. But I recognize that all four have valid arguments. You need to determine what approach you're going to take. But here's what I would encourage you, that as we approach Scripture, we'll take biblical passages at face value, assuming it says what it means and it means what it says. When studying your Bible, ask, what is the normal, plain understanding of this passage in its original context? So with that... Let's pray. We're going to approach the scripture. Gracious God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that every time we open it, we don't read it, it reads us. So today, as we open your word, let it read our hearts. Pray that today you would reveal your character and nature. We want to understand who you are. Pray that you'd remind us who we are, that you would remind us who you've called us to be, that when a world around us is, is fraying at the edges and, and it seems to be descending deeper and deeper into chaos, that, Lord, this would be the moment where we understand who you have called us to be, who we are in Christ. I pray that you would show us Jesus because he is the one that we anticipate returning to this planet and calling us home. So let us ready our hearts for you, Jesus. And then let your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that every scripture that I share today, Spirit of the living God, you would allow it to land on good soil where it would take root and grow, or grow a harvest, that we would be changed by your word today. We'd leave here different because of your word being spoken into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 All right, we're going to read 2 Peter chapter 3. This is going to launch us into this series. I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's 18 verses. Then I'm going to come back and comment, and we'll work our way through it. So once again, 2 Peter chapter 3, the header on the top of this chapter says, The Day of the Lord. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward 
to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some, hard, some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Say it again. Amen. 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 Mm. I'm going to give you four points. I'm going to comment on this scripture. I'm going to introduce some additional scriptures and ideally set the foundation for this series ahead. Here's point one. Scoffers are going to scoff. I'm a former scoffer. I can remember way back in the day, college, Christians coming into my, my room and telling me about Jesus, and I scoffed. And the point of my scoffing was to reject my accountability I had to a holy God so I could follow my own evil desires, to live life on my own terms. It's what Peter writes. He says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. You know, Peter's writing this in the first century, and I suppose to his audience that that was true, that everything had just been going on as it has. And I think throughout time, a, a lot of what, what we've experienced over 2,000 years has just seemed to be going on and on as it always did. Until about 150 years ago. Think about this. Just think about transportation. The disciples, the boat that they traveled on the Sea of Galilee was not vastly different from the boat that Paul would have taken to sail the Mediterranean to plant churches, which was not vastly different from the boat a thousand years later that the Vikings would sail as they would travel around the north, which is not terribly different from the boat that Columbus sailed in 1492 across the Atlantic, which is not really that much different from the boat that Ben Franklin sailed back to France in 1776. But then things began to change as the industrialization of, of our world. And here's something that's really interesting is that people over the last 150 years have noticed this, and they've begun to see the signs of change. And I was reading, this is really fascinating, I was reading a book a comp compilation of messages by Maria Woodworth Eder. She was an evangelist in the turn of the 20th century, in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is a, from a message in 1916. And she was, I'll just read a couple of comments here. She was looking at the wars and rumors of wars that Jesus preached as a sign in Matthew 24, 6. And she was just looking at how much war was in her world in 1916. She said, when we realize that within the past 12 years, eight of the great nations of the earth have been engaged in the awful holocaust of war, and that each conflict has increased in intensity and loss of life, one is made to ask with deepest solemnity, when, what will the end be? She was seeing the signs in the early 1900s. Daniel 12.4 talks about how global transportation will increase and knowledge will increase as a sign of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased, Daniel 12.4. And she was commenting on here in 1916, she's seen automobiles and locomotives and airships and ceaseless streams of news and information. And she said, every car or train that passes there is speaking to them and to us in tones of thunder as a warning from God saying, the harvest will soon be passed and the summer ended. The preparation days are closing. Christ is coming. Go out to meet him. I just find it fascinating. It seems like every generation has always said, it can't get any worse than this. Anybody agree with that? It can't get any worse than this. And then you watch and it's, well, nope, actually it can. But the point I'm making is that scoffers will say, yeah, it's always just been like that. And I would say, no, I'm going to show you some signs where we have seen 
over the last 150, 200 years, just an, an exponential increase of, of all of those signs just happening more frequently, more impactful. Here's another thing about these scoffers. Paul Peter says, they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the wor world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. There's two things that jumped out at me, by God's word and by the same word. It's this point that he's making. It's that God's word declared that the flood was going to come to Noah. The destruction came. And it is by that same word that God declares that this world is going to be destroyed by fire, that the end will come. It speaks to a literal fulfillment. It's not allegory. It is God saying, this is going to happen. Jeff Kinley and Todd Hampson write these words in one of their books about Bible prophecy. They say, the Bible is batting a thousand when it comes to fulfilled prophecy. Every prophecy concerning Messiah's first coming was fulfilled, literally and precisely, as recorded in the Old Testament. If just one of those prophecies turned out to be false or unfulfilled, we would have reason to question the Bible's authenticity. Therefore, since previous prophecies came true, we can expect all subsequent prophecies to do the same. They add that for every time the first coming of Jesus is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned eight times. The Bible talks more about Jesus' second coming than it does his first. By their count, they say there are 333 prophecies concerning Christ. Only 109 were fulfilled at his first coming. That leaves 224 prophecies yet to be fulfilled. So I want to ask you this. If you're a scoffer, why are you scoffing? Is it because there's insufficient evidence or is it because you don't like where the evidence leads you? Here's point two. The day of the Lord isn't just a day. The day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day. When we, when we hear the term, and you re, I'll share some scriptures about the day of the Lord, it's not a 24-hour day. It actually spans a series of events beginning with the rapture, which we'll talk about in the week to come. And there's, there's worthwhile debate about when and where and if the rapture will take place. I'll share with you my thoughts, but I'll give you enough information so you can make your own conclusion beginning with the rapture through the second coming of Jesus. And it spans possibly a, a seven-year period. It could be even longer. But here's how Scripture describes the day of the Lord. We read this verse, three, uh, verse 310. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear like a, with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Joel 2.31 the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.2, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Let me give you some of the, the events that will take place during the day of the Lord. And this really is the, the topics that we'll address during this series. The rapture, the tribulation period, the antichrist the physical return of Christ, his second coming, and the millennial kingdom. So these are kind of the bullet points. They are bullet points. They're on the slide as bullet points. They're the bullet points of where this series is going to go and the topics we're going to address. So if these are questions, if you have questions about these topics, I, I pray and hope that, that if we don't answer them, we'll give you enough direction so you can seek out and further study to find more about these topics. But they're all topics that we'll cover in the weeks ahead. Let's talk about some of the signs that Jesus gave us for the day of the Lord. There's three sections of scripture, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. They're in the Gospels. They're known as the Olivet Discourse. They're called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he's teaching his disciples. And so each of those Gospels share that teaching with a, a few additional details they're all in unison, but they have just a few different viewpoints. And from Matthew 24, I'll read verses 3 through 8, we'll hear some of these signs, and I'll, I'll share with you more from the combination of those 
of the Olivet Discourse. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Say, I'm not alarmed. I'm not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. All right. Would all the mamas just raise your hand for a minute so I know where you are? All right. Let's talk about birth pains. I'll, I'll be the mansplainer up here who tells you about birth pains. You tell me, what are, when, when you are experiencing birth pains, I wrote down four characteristics of birth pains. You help me out if these are accurate. That as birth pains come, they increase with greater frequency. They come more often. True? Okay. Second characteristic of birth pains is they come with greater intensity. Right? The pain... They, come, they become stronger, and they don't get easier, do they? Right? They become more frequent and more intense. Third one, greater visibility. Here's what I mean by that. As a baby's coming, what happens in your hospital room? There's more activity. There's more people. I remember this when my kids were born. They're like, the nurses are moving. They're like, they're on mission, and you're like, I'm just going to step back here. I'm not, I'm, you know, not asking any questions. I'm, you know. And then the last one is there's greater impact. Mom, are you focused on one thing when baby's coming? Everything else, like, doesn't matter. I'm focused on getting this baby out. Greater impact. So as these birth pains continue, you can expect greater frequency. They're going to come more often. Greater intensity. They are getting stronger. There is greater visibility. There's, there, you can see these birth pains. And greater impact. They are just making a greater impact in our world. Jesus said this, Luke 21, 9, these things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. So these are signs. These are birth pains. I'm going to share with you seven of them. There's probably a list. We could probably make a list of about two dozen of these signs when you look at the Olivet Discourse and what other scriptures say about the day of the Lord, about the end. But I want to give you seven of them. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to I'm going to share just some reality of what's going on in the world. And I recognize that some of the things, the, the facts, the little factoids I'm going to bring you, there are people in this room that could educate me even further because I know we have a lot of military. You know what's going on in the world. I know we have a lot of very educated people that have their pulse on what's happening in society globally. So I'm just going to share some little snapshots, but, but I respect those of you that could even take this a lot deeper into what these signs are. Let's talk about wars and rumors of wars. Right now, no surprise to anybody who's paying attention, we have three arenas of conflict right now um, that are forefront in my mind, and I think probably forefront in, of yours. We have Israel and all the Iranian proxies that are happening right there in the Middle East. You have Iranian-backed militias. You have Hamas to the south, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon to the north. You have the Houthi rebels in Yemen. You have all of these entities backed by Iran and their goal is what? To destroy the nation of Israel. This tiny sliver of land that's no bigger than, than New Jersey is causing all of this. I'll comment on this again at the end here of these signs, but call it causing all of this conflict that they want to destroy the nation of Israel. You have, that's one. You have China and Taiwan. What's happening there? Taiwan wants to declare independence, and China has said, that ain't happening, and we know that if that were to happen, there's going to be a conflict. And what is the U.S. going to do? That U.S. is going to engage. I sat down with an army chaplain a couple of months ago, and uh, I asked him, because he had, he had asked uh, a number of pastors that, um, just to come alongside the chaplains, our army chaplains, because, and I could tell there was more to the story. I, and I asked him, I said, what, what's, the, what's the real story going on? He says, well... It's very likely that we're going to see a, a large-scale deployment in the years ahead, and when that happens, the chaplains are going to be embedded with the troops. We need churches to come and fill that void that the chaplains leave behind, caring for these families. And I said, could you expand on that for me? And he says, well, here's what's going on. And he just commented a little more detail about China, and President Xi is wanting to create a legacy for himself. He has an aging uh, nation, and he wants to 
you know, ensure that, that Taiwan does not declare independence. And again, you could educate me more, but this is what, what I understood is that, that that large deployment would be um, our nation going into that arena to, to uh, protect, support Taiwan and protect our interests in that part of the world. Is that, is that a good statement? Those of you guys that know, I see a couple of people nodding. Okay. Um, what's the third one? Russia and Ukraine, right? That's been going on for a while. We see Russia and uh, Vlad wanting to take uh, Ukraine and um, just the ongoing conflict there um, amidst Russia. So uh, Israel, China, Russia, Iran. It's interesting when you look at the final wars in Scripture and then you see that what is happening, it's just it is shaping up for, for some greater conflict that we see in Scripture. Um, a few things for you to look at. Isaiah 17 is an unfulfilled prophecy about the city of Damascus, that Damascus will be destroyed sometime between now and, and the end. We see it in Ezekiel 38, 39, Iran and Russia uh, coming against Israel. It's an entire battle that will take place. And then, of course, Revelation 16 to 19 talks about all of the kings of the earth gathering in the valley of Megiddo to come against the returning Messiah. We call that Armageddon. And that's all wars and rumors of wars, things that are ahead of us. I'm taking a lot of time with these. I'm going to go a little bit faster. Global pandemics and famines. Did you guys experience a pandemic recently? Yeah, we're still recovering. But famines is also increasing. Uh, this is from the United Nations World Food Program, November 2023. Conflict, economic shocks, climate change, and soaring prices for food and fertilizer are all combining in a perfect storm to create a hunger crisis of unprecedented proportions. Right now, in some of the hungriest places around the world, there just isn't enough food to feed the population. Um, it is stunning when you see what has happened to our food prices, and when I, when I read things about, um, about fertilizer, when I read stories about who the largest farm uh, farmland owner is now, I think is Bill Gates. What is going on there? I mean, there's just some really strange things going on in our world in the, in the space of, of famines. Earthquakes and chaotic weather patterns, number three. In the span of 12 months in 2023, a staggering 15,600 earthquakes were detected. Among these, 19 seismic events reached a significant magnitude of seven or higher. 128 were between magnitude six and six nine and 1,637 registered magnitudes between 5 and 5.9. Talk about wildfires. 2020, do you remember 2020? My daughter and son-in-law were married in 2020, and I remember how the smoke was so thick. Uh, it was just, it, it was crazy. It was a record-breaking wildfire season in 2020. Talk about solar storms increasing, that scientists are trying to predict these solar storms because they threaten our power grids and our satellites. That if we were to have a solar storm and the internet were to go down, the power grid would go down, we really would be just back in the dark ages because of just a solar storm that could take all that out. Number four, societal and moral disintegration. I really didn't feel like I needed to bring you a bunch of examples of this because instead I'm just going to read some scripture and you tell me if this sounds like today. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4 but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, selfie culture, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that sound like we're here? <laughs> we're here. Yep. Number five, seculariz secularization. This is an increase of the religiously unaffiliated, a term called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, as well as just the deconstruction movement among Christians. Pew Research Center says, the secularizing shifts evident in American society so far in the 21st century show no signs of slowing. The latest Pew Research Center survey of the religious composition of the United States finds the religiously unaffiliated share of the public is six percentage, six percentage points higher than it was five years ago and 10 points higher than a decade ago. Currently, about three in 10 U.S. adults, 29%,
are religious nuns, people who describe themselves as atheists, agnostics, or nothing in particular when asked about their religious identity. And the Family Research Council talks about the deconstruction movement. So the trend, a trendy new hashtag tempts Christians to look wise in the world's eyes. There are 293,026 posts on Instagram utilizing the hashtag deconstruction, reported apologetics writer Elisa Childers earlier this year. The vast majority are from people who've deconverted from Christianity, become progressive Christians, embraced same-sex marriage and relationships, rejected core historic doctrines of the faith, or on a mission to crush the white Christian patriarchy. Deconstruction. You know, as I read that, the secularization, I do realize that a lot of that is, is Western-based. And if you were to look at the global south, the southern hemisphere, you'll see really a different story because there really is a, a move among Christians in South America and in Africa that there is really revival in some of those places. So uh, while we're seeing the, the Western world, Europe and Canada and the United States becoming more secularized, there is a movement in the global south that is, is quite different from that, which is exciting. Okay, you guys doing all right? Great. Number six, globalism. Paving the way for a global government, a one-world ruler. We'll talk about that when we get to the, the week we talk about the Antichrist. But what we're seeing in this move of globalism is we're trading our freedom, our personal freedom and our national sovereignty for security. A few uh, names and, and people to pay attention to. The World Economic Forum, led by Klaus Schwab. Schwab's been criticized for promoting a globalist agenda that some perceive as favoring the interests of multinational corporations and wealthy elites over the interests of ordinary people. They're planning your future. World Health Organization, International Pandemic Treaty. This was in, in the, the wake of the 2020 COVID. It was, uh, this treaty is aimed at global preparedness for and response to future pandemics. Some critics raise concerns about the potential infringement on national sovereignty, particularly regarding the treaty's provisions related to information sharing, resource allocation, and decision making during a pandemic. You know, if you don't think there's another pandemic coming, I would just say, why do you think the United Nations is planning for one? There's, there's stuff, there's stuff happening. Uh, last one, United Nations Agenda 2030. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a global initiative adopted by the United Nations in September 2015. It provides a framework for countries to align their national priorities with global goals. That sentence right there just kind of gives me shivers. But I'm sure everything's going to be fine. <laughs> Number seven. Global hatred of Israel, anti-Semitism. This has been really disturbing to watch since the Hamas massacre in Israel on October 7th. U.S. anti-Semitic incidents reached the highest number of incidents during any two-month period since the Anti-Defamation League began tracking in 1979, according to the preliminary data. Between October 7th and December 7th, the ADL recorded a total of 2,031 anti-Semitic incidents, up from 465 incidents during the same period in 2022, representing a 337% increase year over year. On college and university campuses, have you been paying attention to university campuses? ADL has recorded a total of 400 anti-Semitic incidents, compared to only 33 incidents during the same period in 2022. At least 1,411 of the total incidents could be clearly linked to the Israel-Hamas war. Now, clearly, what has been happening in the Gaza Strip is terrible. I'm not a fan of what has been happening to these people. But what you are seeing is an increase of anti-Semitism uh, and a, a hatred for God's people, Israel, that is unprecedented, maybe maybe even more so than, than what we experienced in World War II, but, but certainly on par with it. Let me add this. Since Israel's establishment as a nation on May 14, 1948, the Arab world has called for its extermination. The Islamic Republic of Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, the Yemeni Houthi movement, 
have repeatedly called for Israel's destruction and endorsing acts of terror to achieve this goal. They want Israel destroyed. They want to see Israel just slide off into the Mediterranean. The slogan of the Houthi movement, an Islamist political and militant group in Yemen, reads, and I think this, this is a statement that represents all of those groups I just named, God is the greatest, death to America, death to Israel, curse on the Jews, victory to Islam. That's their slogan. Okay, it's concerning, right? Maybe scary. Everything I just shared with you might be frightening. I won't sugarcoat scripture, but I will keep pointing you back, you and I back to Jesus and the promises that God has made us. That's what we need to hold on to whenever we face adversity. We must trust God to be who he has said he is. Trust God to be who he said he is. See, having hope in the last days requires understanding God's character and nature. When adversity comes, you and I need to know who God is and trust him to be who he has said he is. There's people in this room right now, you're going through incredible adversity. And I want you to know that you need to know who God is. You need to be able to hold on to his character, his nature, who he's declared himself to be when you're in that adversity. These times that we may face, it's not going to get better, right? But if you are holding on to who God is, that is where you find hope. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. 2 Corinthians 1, 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. His promises can be trusted, and he is not slow in keeping his promise. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's patient. He's patient for those who do not believe. God is waiting as long as possible, so as many as possible will discover eternity is possible with him. Verse 15 says, bear in mind that the Lord, our Lord's patience means salvation. His patience means salvation. And before we leave this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus. And there may be people in the room that have never made a choice to follow Jesus. Romans 10, 9, 10, 9 and 10 says that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved from all of this destruction, and you'll be saved for eternity. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Jesus himself said in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He did that on a cross, a Roman execution device that, that, where Jesus died for you and I. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So final point is, how do we live then? How should we live? We're to live for the kingdom. Verse 3, 10, and 11, everything's going to get destroyed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. What does that mean? It means seek First, God's kingdom and his purpose for our lives. Realize that there's only two things in this world that are going to last forever. Do you know what they are? It's God's word and it's people. Two things. Everything else is going to be destroyed. So what are you going to prioritize in your life? Are you going to prioritize, prioritize eternity or your comfort? Second thing, we're to look forward. Verses 12 and 13, as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. This earth is a hazy, broken imitation of what God is going to create, the new heaven and the new earth. This, and this world is passing away. James 4.14 says that our life is like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. 
So if you think that this world is all that there is, I would say this is, this is a mist. This is just going to vanish. We're here for just a little while. Eternity is what we are looking forward to. This world is like this, faith, this hazy, out-of-focus reality that isn't real at all when you compare it to where we will be for all of eternity. Luke 21, 22 said, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. We're getting closer, folks. We're getting closer. Jesus is going to come and we're going to spend eternity with him in his presence. Last point, so that we're, if you're going to clap, everybody clap, right? Amen. <laughs> Final thing, we're to be at peace with God. Verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The only way I can be spotless, blameless, and at peace is because of the cross, because of what Jesus did for me. I cannot be spotless, blameless, and at peace with God in my own strength. I need Jesus outside of me to save me from me. I need him to cleanse me. And he did that with his blood, with his sacrifice. He reconciled me with the God that I rebelled against, the God that I scoffed at. I'm going to come back to that quote that I said that Jeff Watchman sent me, that we're not to build bigger bomb shelters, but bigger dining room tables. This is, this is my encouragement, my, my exhortation, my challenge, if you will. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, even now, who's somebody in your life that you could invite, maybe to church service, maybe to hear the series, but maybe just to your dinner table, to your living room, to your back patio. The question you could ask is, you could just say, I'm learning about how this world is going to end. It's just a really interesting series at my church, and I'm just curious what you believe. And I'd love to just sit down with you and just talk about it. And let the conversation begin. Let the Holy Spirit lead it. You don't have to be in charge of where that conversation goes. You just follow what the Holy Spirit does. But invite somebody into your life to just sit down at your dinner table and just engage in conversation. And maybe the Holy Spirit will lead them to Jesus. Maybe you'll just give a, put a stone in their shoe that makes them walk around thinking about something that you said. Here's the bottom line one more time. What we think about Jesus' return and how it ends affects how we live for Christ every day. I'm going to invite Shelly to come on up as we just wrap this all up. This, is, this has been a lot today, but you guys have been really patient, and um, I appreciate it. I want to give you one more Slido experience here, a question that I want to ask you. Okay, so pull out your phone again, right? Here's the question. It's really a question for you. What question do you want answered during this sermon series? What question do you want answered during this sermon series? Type it in. Put it in there. And my hope is that we can answer many of them. We might not answer all of them. But what question do you want answered during this sermon series? And while you're doing that, I would just like to ask for you to answer this question out loud. What's your takeaway from this morning? What did you hear? What did you get? How are you leaving here maybe differently? What's one takeaway that you received this morning? Just shout out a one-word answer. Go ahead, Mike. More. More. What else? Go ahead and say it out loud. What's your takeaway from this morning? God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. I heard one over here. Exciting. Not scary, exciting. Love that. A few more. Come on, a few more. What's your takeaway? What is it? Peace. Peace. It's good. Anybody else? Drama? Drama. Promise. Promise. <laughs> I'm like, drama, yep. <laughs> Promise. It's even better. Would you just pause for a moment, maybe close your eyes and just, um, if you know Jesus, would you pray for those in the room or online that maybe don't? I want to come back to those two scriptures that I gave you. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. 
Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they know me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Whether you're watching our line or you're here in the room, if you would like to say yes to Jesus for the very first time, you just have never made a decision. It's never come to that. This morning is an opportunity for you to receive eternal life from Jesus Christ, his promise, recognizing that he has saved you because of what he did on the cross in your place. If there's anybody in the room that would like to say yes to Jesus, amidst the cries, (laughs) the screams, Would you just raise your hand and look at me if you'd like to say yes to Jesus today for the first time? Is there anybody at all? Okay. Well, gracious God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those in the room that have made a commitment to you. Now, would you lead us to people that are far from you? Would you lead us to people that need to be invited to our dinner tables and just given an opportunity to to learn about your saving grace and that you are coming back. God, thank you that we can approach this with hope, even excitement, as one said this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your promise. And thank you for more, more of your presence. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Are you looking forward to this series? Was this good? Is it all right? Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Before you run out of here, why don't you just uh, take some time and just visit with somebody, meet somebody new, and uh, maybe invite somebody to your dinner table because you just don't know them yet, and you can talk about this message. Well, see you next week. Okay. God bless your day.